Well, good morning and welcome to Church for Family Online uh, this first Sunday in October 2020. Uh, I can't believe we're blowing through this year the way we are. What a year it has been and what a week it has been, uh, whether it's been nationally or locally. Uh, let me ask you a question. What, what cares or burdens or concerns are you bringing to this online service this morning? I want you to know that God is there to hear you. And as we talk about the Red Sea rules, as we talk about um, facing the Red Sea in front of us, the mountains of oppositions on either side, and the enemy barreling at us from behind, as we're looking at all of these different things, remember that God is there. And today we're going to talk about Red Sea number uh, rule number five. I don't want to get into it too soon, give you a spoiler alert, I don't want to go there. Um, but I think today uh, will be a calming message for you. Forgive the wordplay, it will make sense in just a couple of minutes. Again, I want to invite you uh, to join with us. If you would like to watch the online service, and it's about 10.30 on Sunday morning, you're watching the premiere of this video, uh, we are also broadcasting this, uh, our, pa our patio service live. There's a, a music uh, this morning, Larry, Terry, and John uh, are leading us in music. That sort of sounds like Peter, Paul, and Mary, Larry, Terry, and John. That would work, okay? <laughs> anyway, they're, they're leading us in worship this morning, and then I'll be bringing the message. If you would like to join us for patio service on Sunday mornings, as I share with you every week, we, uh, we're meeting here on, um, uh, in my backyard on the patio here. There's plenty of shade and area for, for social distancing. Um, but if you'd like to join us just to kind of get that feel of being back with people again, uh, we have a small group of people that are meeting here. We'd love to have you join us. Email us at churchforfamily at gmail.com and uh, we'll send you the information on how you can join with us on Sunday mornings. But for now, let's just have a word of prayer. Ask God to meet with us in a powerful and special way as uh, we jump into our message this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity we have to meet today. Uh, as we say over and over again, that sounds so cliche, -ish, but we are thankful that we can connect this way. Lord, we ask that you will uh, guide my words as I speak this morning. Uh, Lord, that um, you will open our hearts to the message. And as we do face the trials and the struggles that we are going through, that God, you will be open, or that we will be open to your message to us today. Thank you, God, for being a good God. In your powerful and precious name we pray, amen. Now before we go to the message, I want to encourage you, uh, take a moment to go online to churchforfamily.com, check in with us. There's a, there's a link there where you can um, you know, connect with us and let us know who you are, where you are, that you're praying with us. Uh, if you're on Facebook this morning watching this, why not start a watch party? Invite some of your friends to join with you for this very powerful message. And uh, so we'll see you in just a moment as we share Red Sea Rule number five. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord. He will work for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only have to be silent. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord. Some time ago, uh, I was having a, a hard time uh, sleeping. Uh, not so much because of mental stress, maybe some of that, but more because of my body was just tense. And Terry told me that probably the reason why was because I wasn't getting enough magnesium. She said the magnesium just kind of helps your muscles relax. So she ordered a supplement for me to take right before I go to bed at night. And to my amazement, the supplement was simply called Calm. And I got to thinking about that. You know, people are looking for Calm. People are looking for ways to, to, uh, to settle down and relax because we live in a stressful world. Can I say this? I believe we live in a fearful world. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. You know, today I am... Um, Remember when we started this series, I told you that, uh, you know, I was building off a series uh, by a gentleman named Dr. Morgan um, called the Red Sea Rules. And I told you, uh, you know, I, I'm not making any 
uh, any false statements about that this is original with me. Years ago, somebody shared this concept with me uh, and handed the book to me when I was going through a really rough time, and it just shaped my life at that point. And so I've been sharing these principles with you. Uh, but remember, I warned you that there's going to be some times when, when I may be preaching two sermons. I may be preaching some of what Dr. Morgan shared and I learned from him, uh, but I'm also going to share my own sermon. And this is going to be one of those today. There's a verse in Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. It says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. Now, we know that verse, the old King James says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But in this passage that's talking about retribution, Paul, uh, the apostle, is writing to the Romans, and, he's, and, and they're going through, these Romans are going through a hard time, and he's saying this, uh, don't seek retribution for those who have tried to harm you or those who have harmed you. We, we need to learn to let God settle the score. Uh, we need to leave room, as the passage says, leave room for God's wrath. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. But in the middle of that verse is a commentary that I think is worth us remembering overall, just simply ourselves, and that is leave room for God. If your Bible is open or you can get to a Bible, I encourage you at some point, go look at that verse, Romans 12, 9, and just circle those four words, leave room for God. See, here's the point. Whether, uh, whether it's vengeance or unforgiveness or any other problem, I, I, I can't solve many of the problems in my life. I can't solve every problem, but I, I can leave room for God. I can't answer every predicament that I face, but I can leave room for God. I, I can't do the impossible, but I can leave room for God. So when Moses stood before his people, having just heard from the sovereign God himself, when Moses stood before his people, having just heard from the omnipotent God who had just broken the will of Pharaoh and the Egyptian people through the ten plagues and allowed and, and broke their will to the point that they allowed the children of Israel, those, their slaves, to go free. Having just been instructed by God, a loving God and gracious God who delivered the Israelites from 400 years of slavery. Having just heard from that, Moses could stand before the people and give them this word, fear not, stand still. The Amplified Bible says, fear not, stand still, be firm, confident, undismayed, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians that you have seen today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace and remain at rest. Hold your peace and remain at rest. I love that. The Lord himself will fight for you. The, the New Living Translation says, the Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. You know, earlier in this series, I, I shared with you that, uh, that sign, that, that, that motto uh, in, in England, and it shows up today as well, be calm and carry on. Today's um, rule, rule number five, Red Sea rule number five, and we won't go over the other four today. You can go back and, and watch the rest of the series, but Red Sea rule number five simply says this, stay calm and confident. Stay calm and confident and give God time to work. Stay calm and confident and give God time to work. This 37th Psalm, which I've been meditating on all this week, says this, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Be still before the Lord and patiently wait for him. Stay calm and confident and give God time to work. Now, if you were to go back and you were to do a study on that first phrase in Moses' charge to the people. Remember, they're, they're facing the Red Sea in front of them. They have left Egypt. God has brought them to this, this specific point, this specific place, and they're hemmed in. The, the Red Sea is in front of them with nowhere to go. 
On either side of them, there are mountains, and they can't go to either way, but their only exit is behind, but behind them, the armies of, of, of Egypt are plowing in to come in and to, to destroy the people of Israel. And Moses simply starts off and says, fear not. You know, if you were to do a word study through the entire Bible, go through and count how many times the phrase fear not or do not be afraid, some derivative of that is found in the entire Bible, you'd find out that there are at least 107 occurrences in the Old Testament where God says fear not. If you go to the New Testament, there are at least 42 times in the New Testament where God challenges us to fear not. Now, I would say with that many places, with 149 at least times in the Bible that it mentions fear not, <laughs> I would say that that's probably because God knows it's a common condition with all of us. As I shared in the, the welcome this morning to the, uh, to the service, what fears do you come into this service with today? What fears have, have, have you had this week, whether, whether for our nation we heard this week that our, our president has been hospitalized because of this crazy plague and, and we're praying for him and hoping for the best in his life as, as well as for the, the thousands upon thousands of others that have been infected with this thing. Are you afraid? Are, are you afraid of something at your job or are you afraid that you won't find a job? Are you afraid of something in your marriage? Are, are you just afraid of the, the, are you afraid of being afraid? It's a condition that we all have. But I would say as well, it's also a top priority in God's life to try to help us get to the point of realizing that we don't need to be afraid. God is concerned about us dealing with our fear and our panic. You see, I believe God wants you and I to be emotionally under control. <laughs> I read this week that emotion is motion with an E. In that poem that I shared with you last week, remember, when in wonder, when in doubt, run in circles, scream and shout, that my dad shared with me when I was in, you know, in uh, junior high school. Um, we go through so much when we're, we're afraid, we're panicked. Um, w whether we're frozen on the outside, on the inside, our brain is just going with so much emotion. It's all there. And it's, it's kind of a roller coaster. One moment we're up, one moment we're down, one moment we're struggling, one moment we feel like we're at ease. They say that maturity comes and is displayed through a lack of selfishness. Immaturity happens when you're selfish and you lack self-control. Think about it. You know, I have, I have a two-year-old daughter, a granddaughter, Goldie. And a Goldie, who's just, again, two and a half years old, one moment she'll be up and she'll be happy and running and, and just going at it. The next minute she'll be afraid. Or one moment she's happy, next moment, She's teary died. She's 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 sad. And 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 the truth is, is I know many adults <laughs> haven't got past that same condition in their own lives. See, we have to get to a point if we're going to gain maturity in our life where we don't trust our emotions. And we should never be controlled by them. Emotions are just that, they're feelings, and feelings are fleeting and feelings change. And it's not that feelings aren't important, it's not that feelings aren't good or bad or whatever. It's just that they're feelings, they're not reality. Sometimes um, we have to choose actions and attitudes contrary to our feelings. And, and the Israelites, they had every reason to be afraid. As, as we've said, they had the Red Sea in front of them that was insurmountable. They had mountains on either side of them that they couldn't get past or get around. And behind them, the only way out was the way back. And God said, you're not going back. But the enemies, enemies of Egypt were tearing down upon them to destroy them and, and whether they were going to recapture them or just destroy them out of their anger and frustration they had every reason to be afraid but Moses simply challenged them stay calm and confident and give God time to work Martin Lloyd-Jones a famous pastor from the 20th century said this I do not care what circumstances may be the Christian shall never be ag or should never be agitated. The Christian should never be beside himself. The Christian should never be at his wit's end. Should never be in a condition in which he has lost. It implies a lack of trust and obedience. 
Trust God with the impossible. Leave room for him to work because God has promised to fight for us. But as we've done so many times this during this series, as I'm to this point in the message, I, I have to say to myself, that's fine, but how do I do that? God, you're asking me to trust you. You're asking me to be calm, but you obviously don't understand the circumstances that are going on around me. Pastor Paul, he may be the super Christian, yes, so <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, that, you know, that other person may be, that may be fine for them, but you don't know what I'm going through. How, how do I deal with the fear in my life? Well, we read a verse a little bit ago. And this week I've been contemplating this entire passage, and it's Psalm 37. And the other morning, very early, as I was on my way to work, I was sitting on the train and I was reading through this passage again. Um, it just hit me. In the first 11 verses, and it actually goes on, but we've only got time for those first 11. In Psalm 37, God gives us the pathway to peace. He gives the pathway out of fear, out of insecurity, so that we can be calm and trust God. Fear not, be calm, give God time to work. Listen to the verse, and you know, I'm just going to read through the verse a little bit at a time and kind of make some commentary instead of reading through the whole passage, okay? So I'll try to hold up my hand when I'm reading scripture, and okay, hold up my hand when I'm reading scripture, and then uh, when I put it down, you know I'm just talking about the scripture, okay? Psalm 37 and verse 1, fret not yourself because of evildoers, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Now, fret is an old word that we don't use a whole lot today, but the word behind fret in the Hebrew, it's an even older word. And that word, the Hebrew word that is translated here, fret not, literally means a slow burn or to kindle a fire. Now, it's funny, if you look up the word kindle uh, on Google, uh, you, you'll get uh, an advertisement for a reading machine. But the word kindle was the idea of starting a fire, keeping that fire going. Fret not because of evildoers. Don't, when you see evildoers, when you see people doing evil, don't just sit there in a slow burn of anger and fear. Because that fear, fear sometimes just overwhelms us, but other times it's just that subtle burn within. Fret not because of evildoers. And that word evil there, that's the same word that's used in Genesis chapter uh, 3, where it talks about the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, in chapter 2 and 3 of Genesis the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we think of evil, well, evil's obviously everything that's not good, but what is that? The word evil, the Hebrew word there for evil is the word ra. So I call it ra-ers, those that are evil doers, they're ra-ers. The word ra there literally means anything contrary to God's nature. On Saturday mornings, our men are going through a book called uh, Respectable Sins. And interesting enough, on Saturday this week, as we were going through that, uh, we were talking about the unrespectable sin of ungodliness. And we think of ungodliness as other people that are bad and evil, but ungodliness is anything that is not godly. That means if you that impure thought, that, that short thought of anger, envy, anything that doesn't match up to God's godliness is a sin because it falls short. All have sinned and fall short of the glory, the godliness of God. It says there, fret not because of people that you see that are doing ungodly things. And it's easy for us to excuse ours, but for the grace of God, there go I. You know, it's easy for us to excuse ours and look at others. But, but we do, we tend to look at other people. We look at their evilness. If, if you, can't, um, you can't stop uh, watching the news, it's everywhere today, um, and, and it's bombarding us with, with all this stuff, and we're judging what's evil and what's not, and the arguments of all of this. Fret not because of evildoers, I've got to keep going, and be not envious of wrongdoers. Now the word wrongdoer there, okay, envy, that's to focus on. When you envy someone, you focus, you want what they want, but it's because you're envying it. You're fo it's it's the, the, the focus of your soul, your desire is on what they have. He says, don't be envious of wrongdoers. And the word wrongdoer there has to do with injustice. 
And if evil has to do with more of an inward focus of I'm evil and I'm, I'm, I'm doing it outward, but, but it's the inward side of me coming out, the idea of a, of a, of a wrongdoer is somebody who is doing it on the outside. And God is telling us here, the psalmist is telling us, God's telling us through the psalmist here, don't let your life be burned up, focused on those who do evil and those who do injustice. Don't focus on those people. Verse number two tells us why. For they shall soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. You see, here's the point. Don't focus on what's not going to last. And those evildoers, <laughs> they're not going to last. Yes, they're here now, and it's very, very real while they're here. But they're soon going to fade away. You know, the, 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 the weed in the middle of the yard is there, but eventually it's going to die away. They'll wither like the green herb because they can't sustain themselves because our sustenance is in God. They won't last. Evildoers come and go. Even in, in, in your own life, as long or as short as it's been, think about those who have risen that you thought were bad people, and they're gone. Don't be focused on that. And here's the key. Don't put your focus on the wrong people. Be calm. Fear not. Stay calm. Give God time to work. Don't put your focus on wrong people. But the psalmist goes on in verse number 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. What a great thing there. Now, it's often hard for us to get a grasp on the word trust. The word trust wasn't a... Uh, when the Hebrews used words, the Hebrew language was a very concrete language. We have a lot of words that are kind of um, ethereal. Uh, they, they speak of ideas. But when the Hebrew language, they, they thought in very concrete things. So to, to speak of something like trust, the word trust there literally meant to take shelter. The root there was to take shelter in. But the word expanded literally meant to grab tightly onto. And you know what this is like. My, my little granddaughter Goldie again, we'll go back to her, when she's afraid. You know what she does? She runs to her mom or grandma or her grandpa usually her grandma, and grabs a hold of Terry and just doesn't want to let go. I've seen it over and over again. That's the idea of trust. It means to grab a hold of. You know the song that we sing at the end of our, our live service um, every week now is, Oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. We talk about God never letting go of us, but this trust here is the idea of it's not God letting go of us, it's us trying to let go of God. And while God won't let go of us, we need to hold on to him. We need to hold tightly to him. You see, when people do injustice, back to verse number one, when people do evil, do you know why they're doing it? Because they don't trust God to do good. People do evil and injustice because they want to be in control because somehow they think that's the only way they're going to be able to satisfy and protect themselves. They don't trust God. But verse 3 here says, trust in the Lord, do good. And then it goes on to say this, dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Now, how do I trust God and do good? How do I trust God to just do good? Well, it says there that we literally just need to relax, to live in the land. The, the, trust where God has us and what he has us doing. And then it says to befriend faithfulness. What a great way. That Hebrew word literally is the word to cultivate. Cultivate faithfulness. Here's a word we don't use a whole lot in the English language anymore. Cultivate fidelity. Trust God Fear not, trust God, stay calm, give God time to work. How do you do that? How do you keep from fretting? Well, you keep from fretting by getting your mind and heart and life busy doing what is good, cultivating faithfulness in your life. And you know how you cultivate faithfulness? You do faithful things. You just, that's why the spiritual disciplines are important. You say, well, I get up in the morning and I'm too tired to read the Bible. I'm too tired to pray. I, you know, I'm just, I don't get it. Just cultivate 
faithfulness. Do the things that God asks you to do. Don't worry about the things you don't know he wants you to do. Just do the things that he wants you. You already know he wants you to do. Cultivate those, and then there'll be room for the next thing. Don't just focus. Grab tightly onto God. And by grabbing tightly onto him, grab tightly onto him and remain faithful. Cultivate faithfulness. And then verse number four goes on to say this. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, the word delight there, we like to think of as like, you know, you pick up a nice piece of fruit or a nice piece of candy or, or something and you delight. By, oh, that's so good. But that's not the word here. The Hebrew word here is a word that means to be soft and pliable, to mold. Think of it like um, taking out of the refrigerator a stick of butter. And you try to do something with it, and it's just, you can't spread it on bread. You just, you know, you just got to kind of chunk off pieces, cut off pieces. But you let that bread, I mean, that, that butter, just soften a little. And you can mold it into anything. You can do that. You can mold something. That, that clay that's, you know, when you first get it, it's so hard, and you start pushing on it, and eventually it softens up, and it's moldable. That's the idea here. Delight yourself in the Lord. So enjoy God that you just kind of relax and let him mold you. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, desires there is the idea of request or petition. Now, be careful. This verse is not saying um, you can ask God for whatever you wish and he'll give it to you. First, as your prerequisite, delight yourself in the Lord. In other words, be moldable to God and enjoy that softness, that ability to just let God mold you into his hand. And then... He will give you the desires of your heart. And what I like about this, it's not the desires of my mind. It doesn't say they're desires of my body. It says the desires of my heart. And, and I like to use Terry as the best illustration of this. I tell, I tell young people this all the time. I said, for years, I had this perfect vision of what I wanted in a woman to spend the rest of my life with. And I prayed for that and I looked for that. And then God looked beyond what I was talking about, to him about, looked beyond what I thought, and he shaped Terry to come into my life. And when Terry came into my life, it's like, God, that's exactly what I wanted. And as if God was saying, I knew that all along, Paul. I knew what you needed. I knew what you wanted. I wasn't going to force it on you. I was just going to prepare it and give you what you were really asking for. Thank God he gives us what we really desire and not what we're asking for all the time. How, how do I keep from fearing? I keep from fearing by focusing on the wrong people. I keep from fearing by holding tightly to God and staying faithful to him. I, st- I, I, I don't fear, I keep from fearing by allowing God to answer the heart, my heart's desire, trusting him that what he'll give me is what I really want. You know, we say, well, God will give you what you need. No, God will give you what you want. The problem is you don't always know what you want. Thank God he gives us not just what we truly want in our lives. Verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. And this is so good because the word commit there in the Hebrew literally means to roll over. To roll down like a stone rolling over and over and over. To roll over to get to somewhere. You know, we used to sing this song in, in a Sunday school. Roll away, roll away, roll away. Every burden of my heart, roll away. That's kind of the concept here. Roll away every burden of my heart. But where am I rolling it to? I'm rolling it to God. God, you take this here. Commit your way to the Lord. But I wish I had time to talk about the way today. That's a whole nother sermon. Commit your way to the Lord. Just roll roll your way to God. Just say, God, I'm rolling it over to you. And the most times the reason we're fearful is because we're afraid things aren't going to go the way we want them to go. They're going to go in a way that, that we're afraid of. Just do what God asks you to do, as we'll talk about here in a minute. Roll away. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust him and he will act. 
Trust him. This is the same word we talked about back in verse 3. Cling to him. Roll your way over to God. Grab a hold of him. And he will act. He will do what he says he will do. Stay calm and confident. Give God time to work. Trust God and give him time to act. You know, that we see that phrase, wait for it. Wait for it. I love that, that, uh, that commercial, you know, that squirrel commercial where they, they, you know, they put the, you know, the object out in the middle of the road and, and then they, you know, they run across the road and the, the car squirts, that old Geico commercial. I, I wish I could remember it now. I should have put up the clip for that. But the point is they're sitting over on the side anxiously waiting for it. You know, if we just learn to relax and wait for God to work. Think about the times in your life where you've done that. You've been afraid, you, you've been fearful, and then you've sat back, or you've been anxious about something happening. Several times recently, it looked like something was going to happen, and I was all excited, and I, I was tempted to take, start planning in that direction, and I went, you know what? I'm just going to wait for God to do what God's going to do. And you know what? He will. Verse 6, He will bring forth your righteousness as a light, and your justice as the noonday. Now what's so wonderful about this verse is he doesn't say he will bring forth his righteousness. He says he will bring forth your righteousness. Because here's the thing. A lot of times the reason I'm fearful is because I'm being misunderstood. I'm being misapplied. People are, are misusing my motives. Oh, this has happened over and over again in my life. And I have fretted and I've worried and Terry will tell you the, the, the sleep that I've lost, the, the weight. It's a, it's, it's a great diet when you get like that because you can't eat, you can't do anything. And you are so fearful, you're so overburdened because you know people are taking what you've said and what you've done wrong. And they're just like, you were wrong, you were not righteous in this. But he says, he will bring forth your righteousness as a light. Wait on him. Give God time to work because you know if you do and you're right... God will expose your rightness. There will come a time, and i got to tell you, in my own life, especially as a pastor, there have been a few times, there have been plenty of times when I've done something that's wrong. But there have been times when it's like, God, I knew I was doing what you asked me to do. Still misunderstood. And you know what's happened, and it'll happen again. God's going to take care. God settles the records, not me. But there have been times where it's like time's gone on, and it's like, do you see there? It's not I told you, Snow. It's not, oh, see, I was right. It's like, you know, God, I didn't say anything. But you defended me. God will be the one to defend. You do what's right. God will defend you. You don't have to defend yourself. Your justice as a noonday. You see, we don't believe. Here's a, we don't believe that God will do the work. But just know this: God will never leave a believer hanging out. He'll never leave you out there. He will not in His time. But there will come a time when God will reveal your light that your right decisions, your right actions. So do what's right. Trust God and do good. God will take care of the response. Believe that God won't leave you hanging. He will justify you. And I know that sounds a little selfish there, but the point is the psalmist says it here. He will. Just trust God. And we're going to see in, in our Exodus story as we get near the end of the Red Sea rules, we're going to see God is going to justify his people. He's going to show their righteousness in what's done. Verse 7. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Now let me, let me re-read that in the Newell translation. Be still. Literally the Hebrew there means to grow silent. Grow silent in the Lord and wait patiently and confidently for him. Now, what I like about that phrase, be still, the Hebrew there is to grow silent. Now, notice it says grow silent. Because <laughs> there's plenty of times in my life where I panic and I'm just, in my brain, it's just going 100 miles an hour, talking to God, talking to me, just talking, talking, talking. And, and it's like God's going, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, whoa. Slow down, slow down. Calm down. Every, shh, shh, shh. Good. Grow silent. But the only way I can do that in my heart, in my spirit, in my mind, is to grow silent in the Lord. Back to that trust. I literally got to crawl into the heart of God. I've got to grow silent and just do it in the Lord. And then wait patiently and confidently for Him. 
Stay calm and confident. Give God time to work. Verse 7 says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the one who carries out evil devices. You see, you know why my brain tends to spin so wildly so often? Because I'm envying those who were prospering. I know what they're doing is not right. So I, got a, sometimes it's like, I feel like King David sometimes, and I'm, I'll never match up to, to him. But sometimes it's like, God, I, I, look at me. I'm doing what's right. I'm trying to live for you. And look at them over there. They're getting, and, and I, I start to envy. I start to fret and envy and focus on those people. I, I, I tend to be frustrated over those who continue to do wrong and yet they get away with it. Calm yourself before the Lord, then wait for it. Don't envy because envy never works. Every time you are jealous over someone else, every time you're envious over what they have or what they do or what they get away with, you know what, would you email me and tell me the last time that worked for you? How did that work for you? How did that help? I feel like Dr. Phil now, how's that working for you? How did that envy work for you? It didn't. And then verse 8 says, refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Literally, the word refrain there means to cease, but it also means to relax and just sink. The word refrain there carries the idea of just give up. You, you ever see a little child and you're, they're, they're, the adult's trying to hold them and protect them and the child's just fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and then all of a sudden they just relax. That's the idea of refrain. Your anger is what gets you, go, tightens you up and you fight and you go and God says just relax. Let go. Give up your anger. This is a good one for me because I, I, I hate to say it, but I've got an angry side of me. Let go of your anger. And then it says forsake wrath. And the word wrath there literally is the Hebrew word for face or nostrils. <laughs> when you're angry, your nostrils flare. It's in your face. It says, what does it do for you? Fret not yourself. It only tends to evil. <laughs> okay, here's the point. It never turns out good. Anger Anger never turns out well. It always ends badly. Now, I'm not going to say anger doesn't work because it works for a while. But I will tell you this. It never ends well. It only gets worse. Give up your anger. It only makes things worse. Now, why should I do all of that? Let me give you the last few verses as we wrap this up. Why? Verse 9. For evildoers shall be cut off. Stay calm and confident. Give God time to work. For evildoers will be cut off. See, wait. The truth is they're not going to last. Now, in this moment, it feels like it's taking forever. But the truth is we haven't experienced forever yet. So to say it's just taking forever, Pastor Paul. God is taking forever. You don't know that because it hasn't been forever yet. Stay calm and confident. Give God time to work. God's time doesn't work like our time. For evildoers shall be cut off, but, here's where God butts in again, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Now mark that verse, we're going to come back to it. Those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Verse 10. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Now, I know it doesn't seem like a little while, but remember, God's time doesn't work like our time. They're not going to last. It's going to stop. In a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look at his place, he will not be there. Verse 11, but the meek shall inherit the land. Now, that verse sounds familiar. Psalm 37, 11, but the meek shall inherit the land. That verse is so important that Jesus quoted it in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, Matthew 5, 5. And you know, scholars, you know that the word meek there is the idea of self-control. It's meek, not weak. It's the idea of strength under control. The idea here is those who use, they have strength, 
They have power. They may have anger, you know, they may have the potential for the anger and the wrath and all the power that comes from that. But they keep it under control. They are meek. And then it says in verse, again, to verse number 11, but the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Now there's that word then, delight. Delight is the idea of sinking into and just enjoying it, okay? Imagine an entire pool full of milk chocolate and just sinking into it. Delight yourselves in abundant peace. Peace. Now, isn't that the opposite of fear? Here's what he's saying. We are guaranteed peace. God guarantees us a way out of this situation. There's going to be a way out of the, of the Red Sea and the mountains and the army. It's coming. There's going to be a way out, but we have to wait. But we're guaranteed it. God guarantees us that we will delight in abundance of peace if we just allow our God-given self-control through these situations. Stay calm, relax, be pliable. Just sink into what God is doing because he promises his abundant peace. Stay calm and confident. Give God time to work. Leave room for God. Not your own vengeance. Leave room for God. Fear not. Stand firm. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. That enemy, that problem that you see today, there's coming a day when you shall never see it again. The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to be silent. Stay calm and confident. Give God time to work. Lord, in the midst of our fear, in the midst of our panic, in the midst of our envy and our anger and all the things that go with the fact that we are just insecure, sinful creations, we want to stay calm and confident and give you time to work. Now, before I close this prayer, as I do almost every message, if you're listening to this today and you say, well, Pastor, that all sounds good, but how do I do that if I don't even have God in my life? Here's what you need to understand. God has always been around you. God has always been influencing you, whether you realize it or not. He's been there. What he wants you to do is allow you to let him inside here. He wants you to allow your space to become his space. You just need to come to God and say, God, I realize I can't do this myself. I am a sinner. I've done wrong. I know that. But more than that, that sin has separated me from you. I feel that separation, God, and I don't want it anymore. What I want is you in my life. God's God's word says, whoever calls upon his name, he will save. So simply come to him and say, God, I can't do this anymore myself. I give myself over to you. I trust you, okay? I I make myself pliable to you. I receive your offer of forgiveness and eternal life. I give you my life. Come into my life. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, God, you're the boss. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. God, you are the one who rose from the dead to prove you have power over sin and death and you can take care of my sin. That's the one God says he will save. Whoever calls on his name, he will save. And I want to challenge you even today to make that decision for Christ. And then all of us again, stay calm and confident. God is going to work. Now, before I close again, I want to encourage you, go back over the last half of this message, Psalm 37. Go back and dwell in those passages. Psalm 37, verse 1 through 11. Stay calm and confident. Give God time to work. God, thank you so much for the message this morning. God, thank you for how you've ministered to me once again through this passage. And my prayer is is that those who listen to this, they will experience 
your work in their life, just like, God, you're working in mine. Thank you, God, for being there and doing your work. In your name we pray. Say it with me. Amen. Well, I hope that was an encouragement to you as we shared this rule. Stay calm and give God time to work. Stay calm and give God time to work. Uh, again, I told you it was going to be two messages this morning, so I hope you were encouraged by one or the other as we shared them today. I want to remind you just of a couple of things. First of all, please connect with us, as I said before the message. Um, let us know who you are, where you're coming from, uh, where you're listening to us at. Um, there's also a place on our website, uh, churchforfamily.com forward slash giving uh, where you can give your tithes and offerings to Church for Family. Uh, continue to pray. We're, we're praying that things work out soon so that we can be back at the Grange in person. But in the meantime, we'll continue to, continue to do this. You can also download the complete set of the Red Sea rules, uh, the, the 10 rules at churchforfamily.com forward slash Red Sea rules. And uh, you can find information there. You can also go back and watch all the other videos in this series, as well as all the videos uh, that we've been doing since we started meeting like this. So uh, again, thank you for being here today. Continue to pray uh, for your church, for your church family. Continue to reach out to those around you. And we look forward to seeing you again next week at Church for Family Online.